I'm, my name is Gordon Feller. I'm here from Silicon Valley in California, and I represent an organization that was founded inside the World Bank in 1992. Uh, the organization is called the Urban Age Institute. I think you can see that under my name. About a year ago, I had an opportunity to sit down with our presenter tonight and talk with him about some of the work that he's done in the chemical industry. Before I introduce Ton, I want to introduce you to the company that he represents. Tajin has about $10 billion annual sales, um, 160 companies worldwide. And their aim is to reduce by 20% their CO2 emissions by the year 2020. Let me introduce you to Ton. Uh, he's a chemical engineer by background, a uh, global business executive, one of the few Europeans who serves in an executive position in a Japanese company, and he's an industrialist by experience, a real-world citizen. Most of us think of CO2 as the enemy. That's certainly the logic of the negotiation that's going on across the street. Uh, chemists, industrialists, people like Tan are thinking about CO2 as a growth gas. And the question that he's asking is how can nature be stimulated to use more CO2? Tan? Gordon, thank you very much for the introduction. And to be very honest, Gordon is the cause of this all. We could not get my hands around the CO2 problem. You know, as an industrialist, what you typically try to do, understand the problem first and then go into the detail. You know, when I look at the world, there are only five places where I can store CO2. It's, you know, in the atmosphere, it's on the land, and on the land I mean the surface of the land, including the root systems. It's the oceans, it's the soil, and the soil I define as the place where coal and gas and crude oil is stored, and then at the bottom is the earth crest, which is basically the continental shelf. And then you see at 380, 380 ppm CO2 in the air, there is 3,400 gigatons in the atmosphere. On the land, I've calculated it 500. On the internet, you find numbers that are in the region of 2,400 to 5,000. The oceans, they contain 140,000 gigatons of CO2 equivalents. In the soil, including all the coal and gas and crude oil, is about 18,000 tons. We clearly see that there is uh, CO2 moving from the soil to the, the atmosphere, that's our fossil fuel CO2. Some of it is coming back to the oceans, to the land theoretically. There is CO2 moving from the land to the atmosphere, that's the decomposition of biomass. And there's also CO2 coming back for the growth of the, uh, the biomass and the same uh, CO2 coming to the oceans and back for the uh, the biomass growth in, in the ocean. So those are the flows that take place. Then I started to see, well, can I quantify those numbers? And the answer is yes. We have 22 gigatons of CO2 flowing to the atmosphere in 1990. The 2004 number is 29. For this presentation, I've used the 29 gigatons um, of CO2 going into the atmosphere out of the soil. I have completed my supply demand balance and inventory system. You know, and if you're in industry, this is what you do all the time. You run a process, you want to know how much product is here, how much is over there, why does it move, how does it go. But I couldn't, why and how does CO2 get back out of the oceans? You know, the answer is the carbon pump. And it indicates that around the equator, the CO2 is coming out of the water. And where the blue areas is, there is CO2 going into the water. Then, to be complete, um, what you do in industry is you typically talk in terms of uh, storage, in terms of how many days of storage or months of storage. So you divide the amount of inventory with the demand. And then you see that in the atmosphere, we have 17 years of CO2, which is basically very small if you think about natural processes. We got 35 years of CO2 stored on the land. What you see is that if you put CO2 into the atmosphere, 
you might as well put it into the ocean because that's where it all comes out. That concept that CO2 to the atmosphere equals CO2 to the ocean is very powerful. I got these numbers, I got the stories, I can see how it works, I can play around in my mind, and it confirms that the world seems to be a very delicate balance. Until I saw this graph. During the annual cycle, we see here CO2 going, the ppm going down and then going up. We know that 6 ppm is because 80, you know, 2 ppm was the increase for 18 gigatons, so 6 ppm all of a sudden is 54 gigatons of CO2. So you, you see that 6 ppm equals 54 gigatons. Why is all of a sudden during the spring and the summertime the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere comes down? So this quiet, you know, model of tranquility and very delicate processes is very much disturbed by this because what we have is we got a stable average and then during the summer and the spring spring and the summer we have a tsunami of CO2 going out of the atmosphere and six months later we pump even more in. Then I started to calculate it because I got my flows. I can reference it, I can visualize it and I can start making, you know, flow charts. So what I did is this is my annual number, the 18 inventory buildup and the flows, the numbers, maybe you recognize them. The, the, the red ones is the demand, the dark ones, the black ones is the supply. So now I know that on an annualized basis, I increase by 108. We have nothing stable in CO2 supply from land and ocean and backwards, and we move it this way, we move it that way, depending on the seasons. Where's our future? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna move forward? And then you see that we all love our planet. We all love to share the planet. We've also said we want to have less CO2 in the atmosphere. So how are we going to do it? Well, the answer is simple. There are only two ways. You reduce the CO2 supply or you increase the demand. Uh, my name is Sergei Roginka. I'm from the Academy of Sciences of Russia, Moscow. Well, I, uh, that was actually not a question I would like to comment and very briefly. First, uh, it is very interesting that finally we hear two valuable things. First, uh, the presentation was based on the common sense and everyone can admit that common sense is a rare, rare guest at the negotiations within the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, the presentations like yours make us uh, make a, ste a step back and believe that we still share the common sense approach. To this end, I would like to uh, invite you gentlemen to M Moscow to render a lecture at the Russian Academy of Sciences that is composed of the key Russian academicians from physics, from chemistry, from atmosphere physics, from uh, economy and from politics. Thank you so much. We'll, uh, we'll gladly accept that. And on an uh, optimistic note, I'll end the evening, ask you to thank our presenters, and please join me in, in one round of applause. For you too. <laughs>